Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your word among us. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Thank you tonight especially uh, for the gift of the Gospel of John, for John's friendship with your son, for the way he has related that to us through the years. We ask that you open our hearts and our minds to receive your word tonight as we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so something I did write up here, this is just, as we're kicking in here, um, I will try to remember not to erase this, but if you guys need to, you can copy the sign, you can take a picture of it, if it's something that it would be, you guys think would be very helpful, and I have a, you know, chat with Alice after, if you've got a good ballpark number, we could probably print this out, kind of small, um, for everyone next week as well, if you want to just have this. But this is basically a breakdown of the Gospel of John. But before we get there, I want to take a step back and talk about why the Gospel of John. Last year we walked through the Gospel of Mark. As maybe some of you were even there for that. I think of several of you were. But we talked about the Gospel of Mark last year. Well, if you're keeping score at home, that means that this year, our Sunday Gospel readings are all coming from the Gospel of Luke. So why on earth are we going over this one? <laughs> well, because John doesn't get its own liturgical year. The way the lectionary, which is a fancy word for the book that tells us what book to do, but the lectionary has the readings for Sunday on a three-year cycle. What that means is if we just do the basic minimum of being Catholic and show up to Mass every Sunday like we're supposed to, we will essentially hear the entire Bible proclaimed to us over the course of three years. The whole Bible. There will be a couple chapters or verses missing here or there from like Leviticus or Numbers or something. But basically we'll get the whole Bible in three years if we just show up on Sunday. If you're going to daily mass every year, that's on a two-year cycle. You'll get the whole thing in two years. We have a three-year lectionary. It's a three-year cycle. A, B, C. A, year A, the gospel readings come from Matthew. B, Mark, C, which is this year, liturgical year rather, this is year C, Luke. So where's John? To John. Well, John, we decided it's so important. It's not that it's so unimportant that it doesn't get a year. It's so important. We have to hear from John every year. So the major feast days, the major solemnities, the major moments in church history, um, different times, different, different octaves and everything else, the gospel reading is going to come from John. So for example, if you went to the Midnight Mass for Christmas, or the Evening Mass, the reading, the designated reading, regardless of what liturgical year it is, is the one from Luke chapter 2, the infancy narrative that we're familiar with, the one with the shepherds and the angels, etc. Technically, the reading, the Gospel reading, if you go to Christmas Day Mass, is supposed to be from John chapter 1. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay? So, John shows up throughout the course of the liturgical year because it's so important. But it is very different from the other Gospels. And it doesn't take a scripture scholar to figure that out. When people complain about the contradictions that occur in the Bible or in the New Testament or in the Gospels, Inevitably, they're almost always talking about John versus the synoptics. Sorry, I didn't define the synoptics. When I say the synoptics, and for the next several weeks as we're going through this, when I talk about the synoptic Gospels, that means Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because synoptic basically means same. Like they're similar to each other, so we call them the synoptics. The 
Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So whenever people are complaining about contradictions, they're often talking about contradictions between John and the Synoptic Gospels. These apparent contradictions, these apparent things where Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say this over here, and then John goes off into the Never Never Land or something over here and does his own thing. And that's what this perception that they're disagreeing with each other. I think as we go through this, and even before we do, as we start understanding how John was written, why John was written, who wrote it, and everything behind that, we're going to start seeing why this is just a false dichotomy, why this is just a bad way of looking at these so-called contradictions. But as I said, it doesn't take a scripture scholar to recognize that the Gospel of John is light years different from the others. In fact, you might even say, like, is this being written about the same guy? It's not quite that different. But whereas the synoptics are full of parables and miracles and all these different things, and by the way, in all of them, each of those times, they only go to Jerusalem once. Right at the very end. All this ministry, everything else is going on in Galilee, and then Jesus goes down, and then the, usually the last half of the gospel for all of them is in Jerusalem during Holy Week. And you get to John. Wait for it. Zero miracles. Almost, almost well, well, we'll get to the miracles, because it's like, well, what about Cana? What about the other things? They're not called miracles in John. He calls them signs. But he never talks about a single miracle. He only talks about signs that Jesus performs. And there are seven. Parables? Not really John's thing. He doesn't really relate to any of them. In fact, I'm not sure if he relates to any at all. A couple of discourses. There's a few times where Jesus gets up and has like a big Shakespearean soliloquy. Minus the ambic pantometer. Sorry, I just needed a nerd moment there. <laughs> but he gets up there, he has a couple of discourses where he talks, but not so many, not so much in the nature of parables. The parables that we're used to. But he'll get up and he'll give instruction in the kind of catechesis and instruction on what to do and how to live and what we are supposed to believe. And there's also seven other parts where Jesus makes these stunning I am statements. They're called the I am statements. There's seven in particular where he identifies himself as something. And there's a few others where he just uses this word I am very, very powerfully and absolutely. And by the way, this would have really caught the attention of his listeners. Anyone remember why? What the, what's the big deal with I am? I said, well, that's just the present tense of the verb to be, right? Yahweh. Say it louder. Yahweh. It's the name of God. Revealed in Genesis chapter 3, we remember that when Moses encountered God in the burning bush, and he asked him, well, when I go to your people, Israel, and I tell them that their God sent them, that, 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 that God sent me, what am I to tell them your name is? What, what, what is your name? Who, what do I tell them if they say, who, who is he? And God responds, I am that I am. Or I am who I am. Tell them, I am has sent you. So at different points in his ministry, Jesus is going through, and usually the Pharisees are doing something dumb or mean or something like that. Sometimes he just decides, I think, he wants to get under their skin. Because he'll go there, and there he's going back and forth with the Pharisees, and they're fighting. And then Jesus says, Before Abraham was, I am. And they knew exactly what he was saying. Because it says they picked up stones to kill him. That wasn't even one of the seven I am statements that we usually talk about. Those are just one of a couple of these other times that throughout the Gospel of John, he's going to make a break in the action and he's going to get up in front of everyone and say, 
I am, and say the forbidden name of God that you did not utter. You did not utter it. That was considered blasphemy. But there's a few other times he does say it. He'll say seven other ones here. I'm going to relate them here. In John chapter 6, he's going to say, I am the bread of life. In John 8, I am the light of the world. John chapter 10, I am the gate, or I am the door. Later on in the same chapter, I am the good shepherd. A chapter after that, John chapter 11, he's going to say, I am the resurrection and the life. In the last separate discourse with his apostles, in John chapter 14, he's going to say, I am the way and the truth and the life. And finally, as he's wrapping up that last great discourse, in the last supper with his disciples, his last chance to instruct them before he's going to go off into his passion, he says to them, I am the true man, fine. So we have these seven I am statements. Showing something about the heart of Christ, showing something about the heart of the Father. Because Christ's whole mission, the whole mission of Jesus Christ, and this is something that John is very, very, sees very clearly. So the whole reason that Jesus Christ came was to reveal the Father to us. And this is something that John gets, and that John is always trying to communicate to us. So here, in these seven I am statements, Jesus is revealing something about himself. He's also trying to reveal his heavenly Father to us. The seven signs, changing the water into wine at Cana, in chapter 2. In chapter 4, he's going to heal the royal official's son in Capernaum. Chapter later, in John 5, he's going to heal the paralytic at Bethesda. The fourth sign, in other words, the, dare I say, the central sign, falling right in the middle, Jesus is going to feed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, which, a little addendum note here, is also the only miracle, or for us today, sign, that appears in all four Gospels. File that away. We're going to need it in John chapter 6. Later that chapter, he's going to walk on the water. This is also in John chapter 6. John chapter 9, he's going to heal the man blind from birth, whom we know from different sources, who's named Bartimaeus. I think it was Bartimaeus. Don't quote me on that. And then finally, John chapter 11, at the close of the book of signs, which is the first half of the book, the final sign is raising Lazarus from the dead. A little addendum on that one, and I'll have to remember to say this when we get to the raising of Lazarus, but it's significant that when he shows up to raise Lazarus, they say he's been dead for four days. And usually when, because John at different points say it was, the, it was the this day or the that day, he's very good about identifying the day, often it's symbolic. When he says they get to Lazarus and he's been dead for four days, that's because the Jews in the first century believed that the soul hung around the body for three days. So what Martha is telling Jesus when she says, but Lord, he's been dead for four days, is the opposite of what Billy Crystal says in The Princess Bride. Jesus, he ain't mostly dead, he's all dead. And Jesus first makes the I am statement, I am the resurrection and the life. And then he performs the last of the seven signs. But we're going to see all this, and that's all just right here at the beginning. Seven signs, seven I am statements. Different kind of perspective on a lot of this stuff. You might say also, well, why is it so different for different styles just written differently too? The way it's written, even the I am statements. I mean, the other gospels, it's hard to find concrete moments where Jesus claims divinity. John, you can't get through two chapters without him saying something like that. 
Why the big difference? Well, it's actually, I'm sorry, I feel like we're ping-ponging all over the place. But it's actually because John wrote not just in a different style, but he wrote with what we call a different Christology. So we think about what that word means, Christology, the kind of study of Christ, or the word or the account of Christ. A Christology is our way of understanding who Christ is. And we have, we say there are basically two types of Christology. We have what is called a low Christology and a high Christology. One is not better than the other. It really is just a difference in direction of movement. A low Christology starts down here and moves up towards heaven. A high Christology starts in heaven and moves down here towards us. The Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have what we call this a low Christology. Think about what the disciples say in those Gospels. Who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Disciples are trying to discover, along with us, who this guy is. It's a low Christology. We know that Jesus is a man, and we're trying to come to the understanding that he's really God, too. John starts the other direction. He starts out, and right at the very beginning, we know that Jesus is well, he is really and truly God. He is God in the flesh. And we're spending the rest of the thing to show and to recognize that not only is he God, but he's also one of us. So that's the oversimplifying a little bit, but that's basically the difference between low and high Christology. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a low Christology where we move from recognizing the humanity of Christ to recognizing his divinity. And we're walking with the apostles in that one. Versus John, which starts out with the high Christology, so we start out knowing the answer to the bonus question. And we're watching the apostles kind of stumble along as they make the discovery, but we know the answer and we're trying to see how he's not only God, but he's also human. And he reveals this through his signs and through the I am statements that he is, in fact, both. So that's why they're written so stylistically differently. I was about to share a little bit something because I was like, we, have, we should probably make some notes on the author, the date that it was written, some other things like that, because there's, depending on which sources you read, different scholarship, you'll get a lot of differing opinions on who wrote it, or why it was written, or when it was written. And I want to kind of address all of that before we really dive into the text um, to, to do it some credit. I promise eventually we are going to get to the Gospel of John tonight. But as we're looking at this, before we get the authorship, because um, I was tempted just to read the introduction to this, I, I saw one or two of you had this. <coughs> Sorry, ran out of hands. Um, this is written by Ignatius, put out by Ignatius Press. Uh, it's the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible, and they do this for a bunch of the different individual books. And this is the, the Gospel of John. It has commentary, notes, study questions, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, it was kind of written, edited, and compiled. Obviously, the gospel wasn't written by them, but edited and compiled. The footnotes and everything else are put together um, by, well, I think you'll recognize at least one of the names, a guy named Scott Hahn and Curtis Mitch. Extremely well researched, um, very in depth. This is where I will be getting a lot of the stuff we are going over. Okay? This is like $15 on Amazon or something. Well worth it. Um, but there you go. That's my shameless plug for someone else's stuff. <laughs> this is a great study resource. Um, and I'll be looking at that very extensively, and that's where a lot of the particular textual things we're going to be looking at will be coming from. A few other sources I'm deeply indebted to, I'm going to say this before I get any further and I forget, Father James Downey, who was the uh, teacher, the professor who uh, taught me and many of my classmates about the Jomanian corpus, is what we call it, <clears throat> the, all of John's theology, Gospel of John, the letters, and also the book of the Apocalypse, Revelation. 
Um, so a lot of the other points that are going to be coming up here, if I forget to directly reference them, I'm deeply indebted also to Father Downey. When we get to especially things that get to more of the Eucharistic theology um, and certain liturgical or historical points, uh, I will be also referencing another one of my professors, uh, Father Bernard Blankenhorn, who has, one, he's one of those guys who has like a 50 pound brain. If at the end of my life I'm half of the theologian he is now, and he's a young guy, so he has probably another 30 or 40 years to go, if by the time I die I am half a theologian he was when I was in seminary, I will consider my life well lived. Brilliant man. Very brilliant man. I'm not going to share everything that he shared with us because it nearly killed me. <laughs> it crushed us in the best sort of way. So I will be very picky about what I pull from him um, to keep the body count as low as possible. But there are going to be a couple times where out of necessity, and because it's so great how deep he was able to get into this stuff, I'll be referencing some of what Father Blankenhorn also taught us. Um, other great resources in addition, of course, is Dr. Scott Hahn, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, I'm missing a couple others. Um, oh, Marian theology. Uh, so anytime we, we get around, we start talking about Mary in the Gospel of John, because he does reference her a few times. Um, perhaps also a little bit of Father Joseph Curl, who will learn something, who is a Jesuit from Texas. I guess miracles really do happen. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Like, Father Joseph Curl is, again, one of these very, very brilliant men, a very holy man, very prayerful man. Um, he also was very instructive in just kind of bringing about a lot of it, just kind of synthesizing stuff and bringing it together as well. So these are many of the men, the professors and teachers and authors um, that I'm getting this stuff from. So you can also have access to a few of those resources and know where I'm saying, where some of the stuff is perhaps coming from. You're like, oh, I've never heard that before. It's like, yes, because Father Blankenhorn like, has a 50% of you know, survival rate in his class, like when he's killing us with metaphysics. So that's why we don't hear it very often, right? No, I'm kidding. I love Father Blankenhorn to death. That was a really terrifying class, though, that one time he went in. He said, look at us, he said, today I'm going to kill you with metaphysics. Which was doubly frightening, because I wasn't even really sure I knew what he meant. Uh, I found out. Oh, boy, did I find out. Um, anyway, we'll get back to the Gospel of John. This resource here, I can't say enough about it. It's a very good one. Um, and as I said, other things I'll be pulling from just various notes, um, books recommended by this other man, so that's where we're going. Authorship. Okay, before we get any further, we should, <coughs> we should talk about the authorship of the Gospel of John, because there have been people who said, oh no, John didn't write that. They'll say, well, the beloved disciple didn't say he was John. There's some other things that go around there. Like, I'm, I'm saying them kind of facetiously. That should tell you what I think about them. Um, but it shouldn't matter what I think. It should matter what is true and what is reasonable. And what makes sense and what fits with the facts. Okay? So let's look at the facts then, shall we? Let's look at how we can figure out who the beloved disciple is. Because the beloved disciple is very clear that he, in fact, is the one who wrote the Gospel. We keep hearing all these references, the beloved disciple this, the beloved disciple that, and then at the very end of the book, the beloved disciple identifies himself as being the author. And so he not so subtly says, hey, yeah, by the way, I wrote all this. So, how can we know who the beloved disciple is? There have been different people who propose different ideas. Oh, could it have been Lazarus? Could it have been Mary Magdalene? Could it have been this person? Could it have been that person? You can make arguments for all of them. I think John still makes the most sense as being actually the author of John. Six quick arguments. One. 
Whoever the beloved disciple is, he's, he or she is clearly an Israelite. I'm going to use just the masculine pronouns for now. He must be an Israelite. He's an Israelite, and we can be pretty certain about this, because he knows the feasts and the institutions of that time very, very well. Too well to be an outsider. Luke, God bless him, great guy, but he was a Greek doctor, and you can tell because he makes mistakes liturgically. When he's referring to the, the Jewish liturgies, once in a while he'll make a mistake. Nothing to undermine the truth of what he says, and if that, anything, though, kind of validates that it was really him writing it. So, the other Gospels, once in a while, there'll be a mistake slip in here or there in terms of describing a liturgy or a feast or a festival. John makes none of them. John doesn't make any mistakes. Whoever wrote this knew what they were talking about very, very well. So he was an Israelite. Oh, by the way, his description of Palestinian geography is dang near perfect. So it was someone who knew the area very well. So he knew the feasts, he knew the festivals, he knew the liturgies, and he knew the geography. The beloved disciple was an Israelite. Check, that's one. Two, because of the level of detail he goes into during the Last Supper discourse relating a conversation that Jesus is having with the Apostles, who as far as we know were the only people with Jesus during the Last Supper, we can probably fairly reasonably narrow down the beloved disciples being one of the Twelve. Does that seem reasonable? If you look at the level of detail in that discourse, it goes on for several chapters. That's relating something that needed to be, was, would have been heard by someone in the room. As far as we know, the only people in the room were the twelve. Israelite? One of the twelve. But by the way, it's not just the Last Supper, he was also with the band of apostles after the resurrection. Okay, so he's one of the twelve. Okay, hang on, back up. He's one of the eleven, because he clearly is a Judas, right? So we can eliminate that. So we've got it down to eleven candidates. That was easy. To say that he is, quote, beloved, suggests that he's probably a member of the inner circle. Right? Jesus, obviously, was close to all his disciples, but Peter, James, and John, he was particularly close to. This is very obvious from not just the Gospel of John, but also from the other Gospel accounts, that he had a special friendship with those three. So it makes sense that the beloved disciple would be one of those three, Peter, James, and John. Peter clearly is not the beloved disciple, because over and over again, there's a contrast between John, or excuse me, a contrast between Peter and the beloved disciple, where they're seen going around in tandem. And they're both mentioned as being present, but not the same person. So it's not Peter. So now it's James or John. Well, James, we know from the book of Acts, was martyred very early on, after Jesus rose from the dead, which means that he would have had time to write the gospel. John seems to be the only logical conclusion if we're going to accept that as being one of our criteria. Four. Just mentioned that the beloved disciple of Peter are mentioned as going in tandem quite often throughout the book. From the beginning all the way to the end. They're always here, but they're not mentioned in the same breath. Or they're mentioned being together, but not like as the same person, right? Well, this actually fits a pattern that we see in Luke's writings too, when we look in the book of Acts, where Peter and John are still hanging out all the time at the beginning of the book of Acts. Whenever one of them is going, the other one's usually there too. Peter and John went to pray. Is anyone else ever learned a little song about running and leaving and raising God about the, the guy, the, the paralytic? Is that just a Protestant thing? Okay, so I just, yeah, yeah, I'm a convert. Okay, here, now you guys all know. <laughs> But this whole idea of like Peter and John going down to going up to the temple and praying, Peter and John being arrested by the same Peter and John getting scourged together. Luke, 
is writing about this. And so we see this kind of repeated pattern that Peter and John are still spending a lot of time together. They're still very close. And that seems to fit again with the model of Peter and the beloved disciple kind of seemingly going everywhere with each other. I kind of mentioned this earlier or alluded to it, but our fifth one kind of echoes one of our earlier arguments, and that is the attention to detail. Not just in the Last Supper discourse, but just in general, the attention to detail in terms of describing, especially the signs that are taking place. Whoever was there, was there for this stuff and really paying close attention. At Cana, he's going to observe that the, the jars were just filled, they were filled to the brim. The feeding of the 5,000, he identifies the loaves as being barley loaves. It couldn't have been someone who is farther than about arm's length away from most of these things happening. He had to be super close to the action. Again, kind of ties and sees an eyewitness, and it also kind of lends a little bit of credence to our presupposition that he was one of the three. Six, we actually have some external evidence for this as well. All right, so in uh, St. Irenaeus, who is basically a third generation Christian, second or third generation Christian, depending on how you want to count it. Okay, so if you think about Jesus passing his stuff on to the disciples, so the apostles and all the people in the upper room in that whole generation, all those people who are converted on Pentecost, that's the first generation of Christians. As that generation dies, their children and the people that are converted in the next generation are the second generation of Christians. Right? Irenaeus is the third generation, essentially second or third generation. He learned, maybe get mixed up, I think it was Ignatius of Antioch. I hope I don't get my saints mixed up here. One of them sat at the feet of uh, John also sat at the feet of Jesus. I believe it was Ignatius, though it might have been Irenaeus himself. I think it was Ignatius sat at the feet of John. Irenaeus sat at the feet of Ignatius. Polycarp sat at the feet of Irenaeus. Try saying that five times quickly. Very, very close to what actually happened. And before the end of the second century, okay, so we're still in the 100s here, the late 100s, Irenaeus identified the author of this gospel as being John. In other words, the guy who is his teacher's teacher, less than a generation removed, said, no, he was the author. Clement of Alexandria also said that was the author. All the early sources all pointed back and said John was the author. I mean, you had me Irenaeus, honestly. But when you look at all of these other early sources who were closer to what was going on, all pointing back and saying that was definitely the guy, I'm inclined to believe the people who were close to what was actually happening, as opposed to someone who lives 1,900 years later and thinks he's so smart, and he's figured out something that no one else has for 1,900 years. Call him the old-fashioned. But... I really believe that John wrote the Gospel of John. That John is, in fact, the beloved disciple talked about. Um, no one else fits the criteria half as well. No one else really seems to fit. No one else seems to be able to pull from all these different things. No one else fits the timeline. No one else understands all of these things as well as he would have. Or would have remembered them as well as he had. He's the only one who really, I think, fits. So that is going to be presupposition one for us as we go out here, that John really did write this. And that's important. We'll get to why it's important in a second. Right now I want to talk about timing. Because this is another thing people like to argue about. Some people, to try to say John didn't write it, I guess, will say that, oh no, it wasn't written until the 100s, maybe as late as 150. Well, we know that that can't be the case anymore because we found manuscripts that were dated at least 120 or 107 or something around there, which means that they probably were around before then. They found some 
some manuscripts and copies of the Gospel of John in Egypt that could be dated back to 107. Which means, for it to have got circulated all the way up to Egypt from Turkey, it would have had to be around for at least a few years. So we can probably say it was at least written by 100. Okay, that's about the latest that we can, we can realistically put it. Is, these days it's probably 100. Very likely earlier than that. Typically, scholars say that it's, oh, it's probably the last gospel, and it was probably written about 90 AD. You can make an argument, and that's actually one of the things I've discovered in this thing here, is that you can actually make an argument that it was a lot earlier than that. It's not a particularly robust argument, but it is a good one. And that is that there is a verse in the gospel, I think it's around chapter 5, where John talks about how there is present tense. This thing over, you know, a pool over by the tower, like those, here, I'll just I'll read it here. John chapter 5, verse 2, that there is present tense, a pool near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem. There is a pool near the Sheep Gate. What happened in 70, in AD 70? Historians, anybody? Jerusalem was leveled by the Romans. Why would you write, there is a pool by the Sheep Gate, if the place you're talking about has been reduced to a pile of rubble? So again, not a particularly robust one, because it's not like there's a bunch of different other supporting things that would do that. But I think that's a pretty good one, because John wasn't an idiot. So it might have been written as early as the year 60. It could have also been written as late as the year 90. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter when. It was somewhere within that probably 30 year window, between 60 and 90. Who cares? It was written by the beloved disciple, who we are fairly certain now was actually John, the brother of James, son of Zebedee, also known as son of the sons of thunder. It was written sometime between, we were saying, 60 and 90 AD. So within a generation, plus or minus, the passion, death, resurrection, and ascension of of Jesus Christ. I just, so it's like, oh, anonymous. I, I, I would hesitate to say that they were anonymous. Um, but I, I would understand why someone, if they wanted to be very, very critical in their analysis of the text, could convince themselves of that. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that if we're going to look at this and not presume that we know better than the people who wrote the text and read the text when it was first written, which is academic arrogance at its worst, I think. Um, if I'm not going to presume that I know more than people who were there, and I'm open-minded about that, and I'm trying to be fair about it, then it's so like, well, it seems pretty clear that what I'm being told is true. But can I say it with 100% certainty? No. That's a great question. I'm not really sure. And I, I don't really care either, because I don't give any credence to them. So they can squawk all they want into the, oh, over in the interwebs. I don't care. Um, it was, well, where, they, where is it coming from then, if, if there's this here? Some of it, too, is that some of these things, um, like these manuscripts of Egypt, aren't, weren't around when some of these things were being proposed. So like when some people were saying, oh, well, we can't find anything before 150, therefore it couldn't be John. Well, we had to discover some of the manuscripts that we have now, which support what we had originally believed, which was John wrote it. All right. Now, 
talk about themes and characters, because like I said, the main theme that we're going to keep coming back to again is John, and it, it, John keeps coming back to, is that Jesus Christ is here to reveal the Father to us. And that the Trinity, which, well, he doesn't explicitly say the word Trinity, he's a lot more willing to, he talks about all three persons of the Trinity much more openly in his gospel. But the Trinity, and consequently, the disciples and the family of God then, as we are brought close to the Father, as Jesus reveals the Father to us and we draw near, God is revealed as family. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you and I are adopted into and invited into to be part of God's family. And this is basically, if you want to say, is there one theme in John? Yes. Family. God is family. And that really is maybe the simplest way of putting that. It's more, but we'll, we'll keep it at that for now. When I said to you, why the authorship is important, Okay? And why I'm operating under this is, is what we're going to do. So, operating under the assumption that the Gospel of John was written by John, what does it tell us? What, is, what can we infer about the Gospel, its purpose, and its author before we even look at a single word in the Gospel? If we say John wrote it. You think, remember what we said. We talked about he was one of the twelve. Oh, but he wasn't just one of the twelve, he was one of the three. Right? So what does that mean? So Peter, James, and John. So John, along with Peter and James, they're part of the inner circle, as it's sometimes called, of Jesus Christ during his ministry. Those three, in the early church, and we see this in the writings of Paul and others, are considered, quote-unquote, pillars. Well, they, they were pillars. Because even beyond the other apostles, they enjoyed a special, close friendship with Jesus. So Peter, James, and John were the pillars of the early church. And we see this talked about sometimes in the New Testament references, the pillars. It's talking about Peter, James, and John. So he's one of the pillars of the church. If we think about that, put that in the context of Jesus' ministry, however, it becomes a lot more startling because then we realize that the author of this gospel was one of the three closest friends of Jesus Christ and probably his best friend. Let's say that again. This gospel was written by Jesus' best friend. Think about the good friends that we have. Think about your own best friend. Hopefully, you have a friend that you can consider your best friend, a close treasured friend, that, that friend that you trust above everyone else. Think about how different, how they would speak about you. If they were called to speak at your funeral, they were called to write your eulogy, think how different it would sound for them giving that. Versus everybody else who knows you. All of your other friends, all of your other close friends, even your family. Think about how different the eulogy would be if it was given by your best friend. Because you see, best friends have this kind of annoying habit. You remember all the really stupid, tiny, insignificant details. But as we know from anyone who's ever paid any attention to Sherlock Holmes knows, the tiniest, stupidest, and significant details are often the most important ones. And so John, over and over again in his gospel, includes these tiny, seemingly insignificant details. Because it's the tiny details that are the most important. It's the tiny details that are the ones that a best friend notices. It's the tiny details that matter the most. And John is relating that to us as a best friend. Relating the story of his best friend's life, death, and resurrection. Now, 
that kind of leads to another point, because you see, John was probably aware of at least one, if not all three of the other gospel accounts by the time he was writing his. Which is probably why he doesn't talk about all the things they do. So, for instance, whenever someone says, oh, but they contradict, do they contradict? Or did John maybe omit something that he thought, well, we already have three versions of this, we don't need a fourth. Everyone's already heard this story. I don't need to include it. That's why it's going to be so significant if we ever, if and when we run across something that appears in John and in the other Gospels. John is trying to put a giant exclamation point on that. So if you already have three versions of this, three, three, three versions of this story, but it's so doggone important, I'm going to put it in too. But if you already have three other copies of this thing, I don't need to include it here too. We've we got three copies, we're good. Someday you'll have three liturgical years, I won't be part of them, and you'll get to hear the story three times then, and you don't need it a fourth. I don't think he was thinking that far ahead. <laughs> but it's why sometimes it seems to contradict, I think. He's just leaving stuff out. He's like, we don't need to worry about that. The other thing also to remember, well, this is might be a little distracting, but these details, right? Because like I said, the other Gospels, you're going through the ministry of Jesus. You know, we say, if I were to ask you, how many years was, how, how long was Jesus' ministry? How many years? What would you say? Three. How do we know that? Mm. No, well, that's see what I would have said to I would have said, you know, along the lines of, uh, no, that's not how we know it's three years. We know it's three years because John mentions three different times when Jesus went to Jerusalem for the Passover during his ministry. None of the synoptics mention three visits. They only mention one, the last one. John identifies three different visits to Jerusalem. Three years. The tiny details are sometimes the most important, right? He omits a lot of the stuff that we already have copies of that story. We've already heard it. So we can include the stuff that we don't have. This is why he omits the parables. But he includes stuff that we haven't heard before, like Jesus washing the disciples' feet at the Last Supper. Only appears in John. He includes details about the anointing of Jesus' feet at Bethany that we don't get elsewhere. He includes these other things. It's an eyewitness. But here's the other special thing about this. And this is what, what I want us to kind of sit with as we enter and we finally get to the Gospel of John here. If we consider this, the, the, the fact that it is entirely possible that John was writing this towards the end of his life, as he well may have been, I want you to imagine this. An older Apostle John, exiled to Patmos. Maybe he's just recently finished penning and, and writing the book of Revelation. And his disciples manage to get out to him. And they find him. They say, we need you to write this down before you go. And imagine an old and tired John the last apostle alive. All of his friends have been martyred. He's the last one left. The last one who walked with Jesus. You can imagine him just lying in bed, ragged breaths, described next to the bed, frantically writing everything he sang, all the little anecdotes, all the little tiny things, all the words. In that respect, we could think of John, the Gospel of John, as his spiritual last will and testament to us. 
to tell us this is what you must know if you are to follow Jesus Christ. This is what is important. Here are the essentials. In addition to the accounts that you have, here are the remaining essentials that you must not forget. I like to think of the Gospel of John like that, like his last one testament to us. The last account from the last reading apostle who knew what we had already and said, this is what still has not been said, but that you will all need. So with that as our backdrop, let's finally get to the book of John. Which is fine, because I was going to be happy if we got through the prologue today. So we're good. We are on track. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him not anything made was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There is a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. The true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world knew him not. He came to his own home, and his own people received him not. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten Son from the Father. John bore witness to him and cried, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, for he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, has made him known. Now this is almost feels kind of like a hymn. And perhaps it was a very early Christian hymn that got reformatted and just put in there at the prologue. Some people have said, this doesn't really match the style. Maybe this was added later on by an editor. Maybe someone like one of his disciples came and said, hey, let's throw the hymn in here at the beginning, set the stage. But we have this hymn here. I like to think that John put this in on purpose, though. And it really does fit with everything else, because I forgot to mention this. The key to understanding, again, all of John is what he says at the very, very end of the book. When he says, he tells you, he's like, all of Jesus did many other things that are not written in this book. If we were to recount them all, all of the books in the world could not fill, be filled. We would not be enough. He said, but these things I have written so that you may know that you have eternal life. So he tells us the whole reason. The reason of the book is to evangelize us. To bring us close to the heart of the Father through Jesus Christ. With the Holy Spirit. But here at the beginning though, and we're going to see this motif repeated a bunch of times. There's a motif of creation. A new creation. And we see that Jesus is ushering in a new creation. And that's why, even using this great hymn, this prologue, it sounds ridiculously like the book of Genesis, doesn't it? I mean, the book of the first creation account in Genesis, which really kind of, if we are honest, reads more like a liturgical text. Doesn't the first, when you think about the first few verses in, in Genesis, right? Doesn't it sound kind of like the response to songs we do in Mass? There was morning, there was evening, the first day, and God's love was very good. And then God said, blah, 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 blah. 
with whatever it is for that day. Blah, 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 blah. There's morning and evening, the next day, we'll say second day, and God saw it was very good. And then God said, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's morning and evening, the third day, and God saw it was very good. It, read, it feels kind of like a liturgical text, and we look at it like that, right? Kind of like what we do at Mass, the responsorial song. But there's a kind of liturgical flow to it. By the way, there's a bit of a liturgical flow to John, too. We're going to notice that as we go through this. John has everything. John has philosophy, it has theology, it has soteriology, it has Christology, it has sacramentology, eschatology, liturgy. It has it all. This is a great book. Today, though, we're just going to look at the prologue. Because here we say, and we don't, unfortunately, don't have time to really get into the idea of logos and the Word. But I want to say this the Word became flesh, right? The book almost. But I want to look especially at how John is making this comparison about Jesus ushering in the new creation. And by the way, this new creation is going to find its full realization and its full glory at the cross. Because when John talks about glory, he is talking about the crucifixion. John talks about this thing. John talks about glory. When he talks about glory, he's talking about a bunch of different things, but he especially is talking about the Paschal mystery and the cross. So this new creation that starts here is going to be building momentum all through the gospel will finally be actualized at the foot of the cross. I have to flip the board around to show you guys. Excuse my pathetic art. We'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John 1 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Genesis 1 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Then God said, Let us make man in our own image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. To double back to the beginning of Genesis again. And the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And John, that is John the Baptist, bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descend as a dove from heaven, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Then, of course, we're going to totally screw it up, and we know how the story goes. I've drawn a picture here. It's such a great picture. We have Adam, the woman, who, by the way, has not been given the name Eve yet. Adam, the woman, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and here's my serpent that kind of looks like a chalkboard without arms. <laughs> I 
Can I just say I'm very grateful for all of you who recognize the Trogdor reference? Okay. Um, but there's, that's Genesis 3, right? The fall. And after the fall, they realize they are naked. They run from God. They hide from God. And God chases after them and finds them. And over the course of that, he finally tracks them down, and he first talks to Adam, says, what are you doing? Why are you hiding? And Adam, being the great husband that he is, he says, this woman that you sent me, she started it. And we've been blaming each other ever since, haven't we? Right? That's a different topic for a different day. But it does tie into this, because Adam, here, I didn't do a very good job of this, is hiding behind the woman in the face of the serpent. The serpent who, if we understood the word that they're using there, is deadly. We are meant to understand that it's a very deadly threat. And the man who is there with his wife says nothing and does nothing. He does not step between his wife, and the deadly serpent at the foot of the tree. Remember that. But when God goes and talks to me, he says, the woman, she says to the woman, the Lord, then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and so I ate. Fast forward to John. When the wine failed, the mother of Jesus said to him, that is Jesus, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what is that to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. The Lord God said to the servant, because you have done this, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother, and cleaves with his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. But one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. Apologies to everyone for the quality and also how big it is. But once again, we have a woman standing at the foot of a tree. This, however, is no ordinary tree. It is a cross, which is going to become for us the new tree of life. 
to replace the one that we lost. Adam, this time, the new Adam, Adam, earthling, has put himself between the deadly serpent and the woman. And he gives his life for her. And Mary here is an icon for the entire church, the bride of Christ. So Christ gives his life for his bride, completing what Adam did not. And his side is opened up, blood and water pour out. We're told that the sacraments, that is the source of the sacraments, is the heart of Jesus Christ. The blood and water, they symbolize the sacraments that we are to receive, and they make them re real. Because the blood and water that poured out from the, sac from the side of Christ, those are the sacraments we receive. We say that, yes, we, people talk about the Pentecost, the birthday of the church, but we can say the church was born when the side of Christ was opened with the lance. As the side of Adam was opened up and God took out a rib and formed the woman from the open side of Adam after casting him into a deep sleep, here we have again the new Adam cast into a deep sleep his side is opened up and his bride is taken forth. By the way, this, we don't know when this happened. Do you guys remember what day Adam was created on? If we're going from just using their like, numbering there, which day of the week it was? It was the sixth day. Okay, right? He rested on the seventh. So on the sixth day he creates Adam, which means the sixth day he goes around and says, hey, we need a help for Adam. Okay, Adam, deep sleep, boom. Here's, here's, here's the woman. Sixth day, God rests on the seventh. What day of the week is the sixth day? It's Friday. On the sixth day, Jesus is cast into a deep sleep. His side is opened up. His bride is brought forth. He rests on the seventh day in the silence of the tomb. On the eighth day, the eighth sign takes place. Remember I said there were seven signs? I cheated. You can make an argument. The eighth sign is the resurrection. And it happens on the first day of the week, or the eighth day as you're counting it. Well, what's significant with that? Eight, in ancient numerology, was symbolic of eternity. On the eighth day, Christ finally establishes the new creation that will last forever. He brings about a new reality that will never end, a new kingdom. See what John's doing? Now we cheated because we went from John chapter 1 all the way to John chapter 19. We won't do that too many more times. But I wanted you to see how John is looking back to Genesis and the first creation. And the whole point of what he's saying is he's pointing to Jesus and saying, Aren't you see what he's done? He has made all things new. Praise to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you again for just everything you have given to us, and especially uh, your Son. The Son who uh, brings about the new creation in himself and also in us so that he truly does make all things new and we also can become new creations in him. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world of God, and The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.